Hello everyone and welcome to our seventh and final video tutorial on statutory interpretation. And just as a reminder uh, to you what we've seen so far, um, I've got the topic outline here on the screen for you. So if you remember, statutory interpretation is quite a big topic and there are three key areas that you need to be aware of. So we've looked previously at the approaches to statutory interpretation and I did an individual video on each of these four rules or approaches. We then looked at the aids to statutory interpretation, which included the intrinsic and extrinsic aids. But what we're moving on to look at today are the rules of language. Um, and I've got a bit of Latin for you today, which I know that you're going to enjoy. So as well as having the aids to interpretation, which we looked at last time, the courts have also developed three minor rules of language, which can also assist a judge when he's interpreting an act of parliament or a statute. And I've got a picture of Harry Potter here, because as you're going to see, these three rules of language are Latin and they do sound a bit like Harry Potter spells. As you can see here, there are three rules. The first one is Aegisdim Generis. The second one is very Harry Potter-ish, Expressio Unius Est Exclusio Alterius. And finally, Necessiter Associ. But don't panic in the exam. Obviously, you don't have to say any of these phrases. You just have to be able to write them down and explain them. So we're going to look at each one of these in turn. Firstly, then, if we start with the first rule, Aegisdim Generis, and it's always a good idea to start by thinking of a definition. And Latin, I quite like, like Latin because I think if you squint at it hard enough, you can often work out what it might mean. So aegisdim generis, generis here is the word that stands out to me. Generis sort of reminds me of general um, or generis meaning genre. And if something's of a particular genre, it means it's of the same type. So that gives you a clue as to what this rule is all about. On the next slide then, I've got the actual definition for you in green here. So aegisdim generis, as we expected, this means of the same kind. And this rule helps judges because it says where you've got general rules, for, sorry, general words following a list of specific words, the general words are limited to the same kind as the specific. Now, I know that sounds a bit complicated, but it becomes easier when we look at some examples. So here's an example for you. And we've got some gorgeous little rag dolls here, aren't they lovely? Um, so I've got an example here for you. Dogs, cats, hamsters and other animals. So this might be your list in an act of parliament. An act might say it's illegal to bring dogs, cats, hamsters and other animals into college, say. And the reason the Act of Parliament might say and other animals is because Parliament might not have the time to list every single type of animal that it doesn't want on the premises. So instead of having to list everything possible, it gives you these general words and other animals. And these first three words here give the judge a clue as to how to interpret these last words. So under Aegisdim Generis, the judge would look at what these three words have in common. So dogs, cats, hamsters, what they have in common is that they're all domestic pets, quite common household pets. So where it says and other animals, if we use Aegisdim Generis, this would include other domestic animals, but it wouldn't include wild animals or it wouldn't include a giraffe because a giraffe is not the same kind of animal as a dog, cat or a hamster. So to give you a further example that's not on the slide here, if an act of parliament were to say, for example, tea, coffee, hot chocolate and other drinks are banned, you would look at tea, coffee, hot chocolate. What do they have in common? They're all hot drinks. So if someone came into the premises with a can of Coke, that wouldn't be banned because it's not of the same kind 
as the words in the list. So Egistum Generis, you are looking for um, the commonality between the uh, specific words and that helps you to interpret the general words that follow it. And we've got a case example that will help to illustrate this further. So we've got Powell and Kempton here and this is a case from 1899 so it's quite an old one but it's a classic on Egistum Generis. So in this case the statute in question said it was an offence to use a quote house, office, room or other place for betting. So you can see immediately we've got some specific words here followed by some general words. So the court used Egistum Generis and looked at what's the common theme between these three specific words. House, office, room. They're all indoors. Now our defendant in this case was using a, a rink at a race course which was outdoors. And the court said using Egistum Generis, the race course was not a place for betting because it was outdoors and therefore it didn't follow. Uh, the specific words in the list. So that's Egistum Generis. Let's move on then and have a look at our next rule. And our second rule of language is expressio unius est exclusio alterius. And again, I always like to just have a look at the Latin words because then hopefully um, you can, it will jog your memory. Um, if your mind goes blank, you could work it out uh, in the exam. So expressio, a bit like the word expression. So the expression, unius, if you think of uni, a unicorn or a unicycle, um, we know that that means one. So the expression of one is exclusio, excludes, and alterius looks a bit like ulterior or other. So the expression of one is excluding others. And that's the meaning of this uh, Latin rule. So I'll get you the actual definition here on the screen. So again, I've put it in green for you. So expressio unius est exclusio ulterius means the express mention of one thing implies the exclusion of others. A classic example of expressio unius is when you go to the toilets in um, a public place, the men sign on a toilet door impliedly excludes women and vice versa. So a sign doesn't need to say men, no women. Just the fact that it says men implies that nobody other than men can go inside. And that's expression of one is excluding others. Um, and... I'm using Rottweilers here because I love them. Um, if an act specifically referred to Rottweiler dogs, it wouldn't include any other breeds of dog. So the way of looking at expressio uni, sest exclusio ulterius, is that it's like a complete list. If something's in a list, um, that's what it covers. And anything not in the list is not included. Um, and we'll have a look at a case example of this. So in the case of the inhabitants of Sedgley from 1831, there was a statute or an act of parliament which was charging a tax on, quote, lands, houses and coal mines. And the court used expressio unius est exclusio ulterius to interpret this. And they said that the act couldn't apply to limestone mines because limestone mines were not specifically mentioned. Coal mines were, but limestone mines were not. And you might be thinking, well, how is expressio unius different from Egistum generis? Because at first glance, they look very similar. But if you have a look at expressio unius, it's a complete list. It says lands, houses and coal mines. It doesn't say and other places. If it had said and other places, we could have used Egistum Generis, looked at what these three things had in common and decided that this might be of the same type. But because it's a complete list, there's no and other. 
it's just giving you lands, houses and coal mines, nothing else, then it can't apply to a limestone mine. So the way you distinguish between um, Aegisdom generis and Expressio is that Aegisdom generis will have specific words followed by general words and other, whereas Expressio unius will just be a complete list. And if your name's not on the list, you're not coming in. That's how it works. So let's move on then and look at our final Latin rule of language. And our third and final rule here is necessiter associ. Um, and again, just by the process of squinting at the Latin, associ is a bit like associates. Um, and that gives you a clue as to what this rule is all about. So again, your definition um, is in green here on this slide. And associter, associ, um, means a word is known by the company it keeps. So associ, a bit similar to associates, is telling you that sometimes you can work out the meaning of a word that could have maybe more than one meaning just by looking at the other words that are around it. Um, and as I've put there, words in a statute must be read in the context of the words around them. Again, this will become a bit easier if we look at a hypothetical example. So if we've got a phrase here, chickens, geese, hens and eggs, the word eggs is a little bit obscure. It could have more than one meaning. It could mean an egg that a chicken has laid or it could be, say, a chocolate Easter egg. There's more than one possible meaning of this. But if we're using the Sossiter Associ to work out the meaning of this ambiguous word X, we would look at the other words around it, chickens, geese, hens, and go, OK, they're all poultry. So X must relate to chick chicken, geese or hen's eggs. OK, so it would refer to a bird's egg, not a chocolate Easter egg. Another example I could give you here is if I were to ask you all to bring me in a birthday cake, birthday cards and candles. The word candles could mean a variety of different sort of candles. It could mean a Yankee candle, it could mean a tea light or it could mean a candle that you put on a birthday cake. Now, you would automatically be using the Sossiter Associ, hopefully. And if I've told you birthday cake, birthday cards and candles, you would automatically know that the candles that I want are candles that will go on top of a birthday cake. Because what you've done is you've uh, understood the words by the words that were around them. And we'll just have a look at a case example where the Sossiter Associ was used. Um, and in this particular case, the defendant ran um, a premises called the cafe and it was open during the night and it was a bit of a crazy wild place um, because, as you can see here, people were supplied with cigars, coffee and ginger beer. So a wild night you could have at the cafe. Um, and the issue in this case was the cafe would need a license if it was being kept open for, quote, public refreshment resort and entertainment. And the defendant was trying to avoid paying this um, license because he was arguing that his cafe was not for, quote, entertainment. And what he was trying to say there was, well, I'm not entertaining people because I don't have a juggler or a belly dancer. There's no singing. People are just having some ginger beer. So it's not entertainment. But the court used the other words, public refreshment and resort, to help them understand the meaning of entertainment in this context. And they found that because it was talking about public refreshment and resort, meaning just a place for people to go, sit down, have some refreshments, they found that it didn't have to be theatrical, sorry, theatrical or musical entertainment. Um, it just meant, you know, entertainment with friends, say. So the defendant had to have a license using the Sossiter Associ. 
just a little task for you to end on here i would pause the video and just have a look and see if you can work out which rule of language we could use to interpret those three examples there and that will just help you to see whether you understand the three rules